Good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome again to your favorite show. It's a Friday afternoon, and uh, today we've got another exciting show. Before we do that, thank you very much for liking, subscribing, and please continue to share. Uh, this is your program, and you're part of the big Friday drinks tribe, and we love it. Uh, today's a special one. We've got somebody who actually knows what they're talking about, Rafaro. How do you feel actual about economist, that? not you. Yes, a true <laughs> economist. <laughs> Somebody who actually <laughs> does this for a living or who did this for a living for, for a very long time and has a PhD in the subject. So, yeah, we, 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 we certainly will learn a couple of things and hopefully the audience will pick up. Uh, Christian, some things thank you too. very much for gracing us. Uh, thank you. For we feel honored. Me. We feel very honored. Well, likewise, I'm honored to be here. Yeah. So before we get in, uh, maybe Rivaro, you can tell us what you're drinking. I know that's a uh, Japanese whiskey. Yes, yes. This is the Hibiki. I think we've had it once before on the show. It's it's uh, it's fantastic. It's absolutely uh, sublime. Um, you know, the Japanese only got into the whiskey making business uh, recently. The, you know, the Scot uh, Scotland has had a uh, hundred you know centuries head start. You know, the House of Hibiki was only founded in 1923. I mean, the House of Suntory rather was only founded in 1923. And this particular um, whiskey they only launched in. Uh, 1989, but it ranks amongst the best in the world. Um, so I'm quite uh, chuffed to have this, and um, you know, it's a gift from a, a fan of the show who wishes to remain anonymous, and I'm very grateful. As you can see, I'm grinning okay. from ear to ear. Well, you should let them know that they actually forgot to buy us from Zoe. Like, this they, is, they, they, it's two dollars fifty. They didn't forget. They, 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 they didn't. They, they just don't find slighted. the teetot. So the teetot on the side of the. Totally the slighted. Uh, well, that's okay. That's what we're having. Uh, Mazoi, it's $2. Well, that's what you're having. Depending, yeah, that's what I'm having. Uh, depending on where you are, if it's Kumatak shop, I believe it's $2.20. Uh, if it's a uh, supermarket, it's $3.20. There's an anecdote. But <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into that later on. But Christian, what are you having? I'm having Everest Black Label. <laughs> One of my favorite drinks has more bubbles than the usual soda water, and I kind of like that. Mm. And yeah, so well, that's what I'm having today. Class soda, okay. Yeah. He's being yeah. prim and proper as 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 <laughs> as a as a former, you know, because if you're seen at IMF, you're effectively a diplomat, aren't you? Well, no, I mean not not while you're there, <coughs> but um, they kind of it's sort of a semi-diplomatic thing if you're yes. a dress up in a country. Yeah. Um, but not really the same thing as, say, a representative of a country. Ah, yeah. so okay. he'll be channeling a bit of George. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Yeah, um, and maybe to just start off with, uh, maybe you can just give us a bit of background about who you are and, okay. and yeah, tell us a little bit more so that the audience can, can peruse your CV and uh, see if you are indeed an economist. Okay, well, let's see. Maybe I can convince them. <laughs> All right, my name is Christian. Um, I started studying economics in 1995 in Munich, which is where I'm from, Munich, Germany, or Bavaria, very important. And um, no, actually, it was uh, 90, 90, 1990, 95, I went to England. So, mm. And I kind of liked it. And after, you know, f almost five years doing a Diploma, it was called Diploma at the time in Germany. I think it's equivalent to a Master's of Arts in England or in America. Um, I wasn't really ready to work, um, like, you know, going into the office every day, and I really enjoyed studying. So I decided to go to London and do a PhD. And um, the interesting story about that is that, you know, I started learning about the IMF and what they're doing and the World Bank. And at some point, you know, towards the end of this program, I said, well, you know, why not apply? Because, you know, what can go wrong? You don't get it anyway, so you're not going to be disappointed if that happens. Because they used it in the, at the time, I think it was like out of 2,500 applications, they took like 20 or something. Mm. And yeah, so I succeeded with that. And if you want, we can talk about this later a little bit, if your viewers are interested in how to get in there. Oh, yeah. Um, mm. And yeah, spent about, what was it, 16 years with them in Washington, D.C., in various positions, you start off as a you know as a young economist in the economist program, and um, you know worked my way up and ended basically in Zimbabwe in 2014. Um, got the job as the res rep for the IMF, opening the office again after 10 years, which was 
really, really an interesting task, almost mm. like a startup in a way, because there was literally nothing. Mm. And um, yeah, after four years, it would have been time to go back to Washington. But we, as you, as I'm still here, you can see we decided <laughs> otherwise. So yeah, and I'm still here. Well, you're married, so it wasn't because of the girls. It no. was because of the sun. It was, well, look, I mean, it's a beautiful <laughs> place to bring up a young family, a young yeah, kids. That's true. It is, really. Mm. And, I mean, we can do here many things that we couldn't have done back in D.C. And the most important thing is everybody's happy. You know, the kids are very happy. You know, you, sometimes I feel like people underestimate what you actually have. You know, a fantastic mm. school system. We were just talking about it yesterday with friends. You know, St. John's and Hellenic being in the top tier on the world stage, you know, in terms of results in A levels, uh, you know, the Cambridge A levels, it's a system that's new mm. to me. But you know, you learn <laughs> as you go along with your kids. That's true. So yeah, that's pretty much about me. And uh, which part of Zimbabwe is your favorite? Um, I like. You know, they're all different. You know, I that's mean, true. what I like about being here in Harare is that you know, Africa, you know, malaria. But you don't really have that here because the, of the plateau that goes pretty much from Joburg mm. to all the way to Malawi, I believe. Yes. Um, so, and the temperatures are like, you know, you can actually sleep at night, even though it's very hot during the day, without mm. wasting electricity for air conditioning. Um, I like visiting the valley, although it's obviously a bit warmer there. Yes, we haven't yes. done that much because, um, you know, the kids... This is in uh, No, that, I mean, Zambezi. Well, oh, Zambezi, okay. Yeah, right. and I mean, my wife... So, and Manapools. I went there, Manapools, or... Yeah. yeah, pretty much that. Or Kariba, but, you know, certain things you just shouldn't do with young kids, especially if you didn't grow up here. You yeah, know, I mean, no, we have friends true. who took their two-year-olds in the bush. Um, not me. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not from here. I didn't grow up and, with lions. And what would you say is different when you look at the way your kids are growing up, because they're actually growing up in Zimbabwe, and how you grew up in uh, in Germany, what would be the differences? Uh, well, I mean, you, know, obviously, you obviously have help, which yes, you wouldn't have in... But that, that, you know, that has pros and cons, right? Okay. <laughs> I knew when I was 14, my daughter's 14, when I was 14, mm -hmm. I could make my bed, and I did, right? Um, yeah. My kids, no. <laughs> no matter no, how much exactly. we tell them and train them and teach them, no, it <laughs> doesn't happen, you know. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, look, the life is basically outdoors, which I like a lot. Okay. You know, I mean, sometimes joke, we have a, yes, we have a dining room table. I mm. think in the last nine years, we've eaten there maybe five times, Yeah. you know, and I like it. It's outside. So it's mostly the kids can do, The kids can yeah. do... Um, you know, sports they couldn't do back in Washington, like simply because I couldn't afford it, like horse riding. My daughter oh, rides yeah. horses, right? Mm, um, that's true. And um, yeah, so very happy. Well, we're glad to have you here in the country as well as on the show. Yeah, certainly um, we need more ambassadors uh, of, you know, I think we get a bad rap on the global stage. You know, you know, yes, a lot of things are broken around here, but, you know, we still have wonderful weather. We have great resorts um and safari opportunities and mm. we you know I, I don't think it's well known you know the, the other side of the zimbabwe story mm. the great outdoors yeah we focus a lot on the doom and gloom okay so an interesting bit is uh while you were starting out your career or studying uh interesting bit that was happening around the world were these structural adjustment programs <laughs> now the world bank and the imf gets a really bad wrap around this but i don't want us to get into the weeds i just want us to yeah, yeah. just talk about globally what was happening at the time why did we start having these structural adjustment programs in in the 90s right well look i mean you know i mean there are obviously there were many countries at the time that got into financial problems Remember the IMF, and sometimes people mix up IMF and World Bank because what the IMF does looks more like a bank. Yes. Um, and what the World Bank does is more like development, obviously. Struck, yeah. Um, but, yeah, exactly. Um, which is, by the way, and people ask me this many times also here, private sector players. Oh, you're from the IMF. What do I need to do to apply for a loan? And I had to explain, <laughs> well, you know, the IMF essentially in the old days exclusively lent to central to the central banks of a country, not even mm. to the Ministry of Finance or government. 
and um, and certainly not to the private sector. That's something for World Bank, for IFC, for example. We talked yes. about this earlier mm-hmm. um, when they, you know, try to help you know go into places where the private sector international investors are not quite ready because of the risk. Um, but that's sort of stuff for the IFC buying shares in a bank or whatnot. Um, and you know, I mean, it's like you get in trouble, you your currency devalued, you spend more than you had, right? So you have to adjust, right? And a nice example or an analogy is, um, and a very good colleague of mine, he was a very senior person in the IMF. We had bring your sons and daughters to work, you know, once a year. And I mean, I only knew about it once I had kids, right? <laughs> and he explained to like a bunch of 10 year olds in a very simple way, you know, what it is the IMF does in a way. So let's say you have a toothache, right? The adjustment would be to rip out the tooth, but that's painful. So what the IMF does provides funding to make the adjustment less painful, which would be your anesthetic. So you stretch adjustment over a longer period of time. You don't have to do it at once with funding, which makes it obviously less painful. But I think in the old days and, you know, Obviously, I can't really comment on, you know, what exactly happened in the 90s or if, you know, what people here often are interested in, the saps and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but I think let's moving forward, you know, from then and on a more positive note, you know, people learn, institutions learn from mistakes in the past, from reflecting on various problems. What worked the, what, and what didn't, what work. didn't work. There is, I mean, during my time, what they came up with is what was called an exposed assessment. So if you had a country that had like three programs in a row, there was a team appointed with a different mission chief from a different department. Like so if it was an African country, certainly not from the African department, typically one from a review department, from the review department, different economists. And they looked at all the documents, you know, all the measures, all the um, targets, you know, uh, um, uh, quantitative targets. And wrote a report on, you know, exactly what you said, what worked, what didn't work, you know. Mm. And I think during my time, I mean, you know, from I started in 1998, um, there was more appreciation of, you know, countries are different. You know, what works in one country doesn't necessarily work in another country. Cultures are different. People are different, right? Um, There's a very interesting thing that uh, we paid a lot of emphasis to during my time in Middle East and Central Asia Department. I was mission chief to the Kyrgyz Republic for three years. Oh, interesting. And that has something to do, and I think that's actually very important for Zimbabwe. And it sort of caters a little bit to this idea that, you know, what works in one place doesn't necessarily work in another, mm. is political economy, yes. right? Yes. Like, I mean, if you sort of um, bring it down to a very simple thing, is every change or every reform, let's call it. I don't want to mention the word reform too many times because that is associated with, you know, the institutions and so on and might come across negatively. But, you know, every change you do in policies, in direction in a country will lead to some people lose and some people win, right? Mm. Um, Typically, you know, and this is, you know, where all politicians in the world are not necessarily the best is sort of the long-term view. And that's understandable. They have to worry about elections in four or five years' time, right? Um, and, you know, getting sort of that um, notion that, you know, in the long run, these reforms are actually beneficial to everybody, you know, and what can we do in the short term to mitigate, you know, the losses mm-hmm. for others, you know, and convince people that, you know, you will actually benefit from this, but not tomorrow. That's true. So maybe we can step back a bit and actually talk about the IMF. What does it actually do? When you look at when it was formed uh, back in the 19, just after World War II. Mm. Uh, and in Bretton Woods, that's why they're Bre- called the Bretton Woods yes, institutions. Exactly. Uh, and how it has evolved over time. So initially it was the banker of last resort for central banks. And yeah. specific, it was BOP, so balance of payment yes. support. But over time, even last year, we saw that now is fiscal support. They even offer fiscal support. So maybe you want to talk about the evolution of the IMF but and what has caused it. Look, I mean, it started off back in the days. I mean, you know, it was typically sort of currency crisis, right? I mean, this is sort of, you know, the BOP support when you know, have imbalances and things, things changed over time. And I think the IMF adopted to that. Maybe not at a pace that 
some people would have wished for. Mm. But, you know, just because you don't change right away doesn't mean you can't change over time. I mean, they're doing now things, you know, um, that I would have thought 20 years ago are not really a core competence of the IMF, you know, mm. when it goes to more like development issues, um, women, you know, I mean, there's this sort of notion. I, I, I love this, actually, if you ignore women in the workplace you're basically ignoring 51 percent of your brain brain power right mm. and um more sort of more these kind of things and because they realize that you know these things are actually important for economic growth in a country right it's not mm. just supporting the currency but are you not stepping on the toes of uh, the world bank and ifc and everybody else? no ifc is private sector and the world bank i mean look traditionally and you know for some teams it works better than for others but <clears throat> Sorry, um, they do talk to each other. You know, okay. I mean, physically, they're literally across the street, right, in Washington, <laughs> yes. um, on Nineteenth Street, and um, and the country teams. I mean, look, when I was here as a rest rep, I saw um, the um, rep or the country director from the World Bank pretty much twice a week, three times a week, and the one from the African Development Bank, because we had this idea of, and I think we're talking about this later, of mm. how can we fix this arrears thing, you know. Yes. Um, so I think everybody sort of just because you're venturing into an area, it's not that you're basically determining what's happening in this area, but you just take it into account when you design your yeah. adjustment program. Okay. So looking at the genesis of uh, the World Bank and the, IF, uh, the IMF, uh, and when you look at the, the biggest contributors were Western powers, yeah. uh, more specifically the U.S., there is the allegation that the IEC and the World Bank are really neo-colonial uh, purveyors of uh, the U.S. Uh, colonial thrust mm. in the rest of Africa, especially the South. That, that's yeah. what they determined, right? The 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 global South. That uh, uh, that expression vexes me because, as a matter of fact, ninety percent of the world's population lives north of the equator. So when you when you say global south and you include countries like India and China, I don't know which what you know geography uh, they're using. <laughs> it doesn't I make don't any know. Sense I to don't me. know, but it, you know, it's them. That's their argument. You know, so they say BRICS is the global south and I say well, <laughs> really not, not exactly. Not exactly. <laughs> um, it's, it's but hilarious. Yeah, uh, there's this idea that Western powers, these are now the institutions. So neocolonialism has changed its face. Before it was brute force, but now it's these institutions that come and uh, they dictate what uh, the global you, you, south. You, you're probably do. familiar with this book, The Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it's very popular in the uh, conspiracy theorists' world of you know a global cabal that is pulling the strings you know from smoke filled mm. rooms um and you know in that book they actually point their finger directly at institutions like the world bank and the imf and they say look this is how they this is how they control us <laughs> <laughs> well you know i i do believe in the <laughs> concept of freedom of speech you know <laughs> if that's what they want to say or what they think that's fine by me mm -hmm. um i i I can understand that some people might see it that way because, I mean, the, the shareholdings in these institutions, I mean, that's a fact, right? I mean, you can look mm -hmm. it up, mm -hmm. right? The U.S. does have the largest share. But, you know, that was based on pretty much sort of the economic power distribution of the time, right? Yeah. It doesn't mean that it can't change or it, it has changed. I mean, they did, it's just complicated, you mm -hmm. know? And as you know, these things, you know, if you think the IMF, and I mean, you alluded to it in a way, uh, just a hardcore economics institution, it's not. We have shareholders, and these shareholders are countries, right? Mm. And they have political processes. So thinking that um, everything that comes out of it is the decision of, you know, say, a Harvard economist or something, not necessarily. You know, they're political considerations. And they do, they do acknowledge that Would problem. you like to give us an example of political considerations that you've worked no, I mean, look, this is, depends on every country. Like, for example, okay. my home country, Germany, is a shareholder in the IMF. And, you yeah. know, they obviously have some views on how they want to see things, right? Okay. And so does the UK, so does the US, so do other countries, right? Okay. And there was a review of quotas, they call it, you know, quotas in the, yeah. in the IMF. 
Um, it's just, you know, and they did revise it. There are some countries that got more voting power, more shares, and, you know, others maybe a little bit less. And, um, and that's fine. But, you know, I wouldn't expect this to change from, you know, one day to the next. It's a gradual process. Like, for example, the same way as the Chinese currency has been sort of added to the, you know, to the, to the basket because they're just a big economy. Right? That's true. Um, but that took time, too. So uh, with the Chinese economy, do you see a change where the, the political consideration of China and India will play a big role in the, IF, in the IMF and the World Bank going forward? Well, I think, look, that probably has contributed to people starting to think about how to change it, right? Okay. I mean, if you're a small economy, um, or no, if you, let's put it differently, if you are a rapidly growing economy and you realize, wow, we are now number two, you know, um, what is the natural human thing to do? You raise your hands and say, hey, I want more say, say in this, yeah. right? So, so how, how do you view BRICS? Do you view BRICS as, and, and now they've opened up a bank, uh, do you see it as a competitor institution or it's really uh, a political institution to make political noise? No, I think it's a compliment. Like you okay. have, I mean, look, you have the, um, you have obviously the African Development Bank. I mean, that's not mm. really, it's not a competitor. I'm mm -hmm. actually glad institutions like that ex exist because presumably, at least I would hope, well, I talk to them, not, I, we can safely say they are uh, more knowledgeable about what's going on on the continent, you know, down on the ground yes. than, you know, some guys in Washington, you know. You have the Asian Development Bank, you have the Inter-American Development Bank, which happens to be in Washington as well, but, you know, Latin America is close. So there are regional development banks and other entities, and I guess, you know, the BRICS, when, if they want to have their own I don't have anything against oh, that. It's very diplomatic. I, I have a different view. Yeah, please go ahead. Let's hear your view. Yeah, so I, I, uh, so BRICS um, initially, uh, the acronym, you know, was coined by uh, Jim O'Neill. He was the chairman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management uh, back in uh, 2001. And he was basically wearing his hat as an economist and looking at the world's economies, the ones that were emerging, that were growing very the quickly. The fastest growing, yeah. yeah. And it turned out at the time that the ones that were um, sizable, that had exciting growth opportunities, from an investment standpoint, were Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And he coined them. Brick. Brick, you know, so that's, you know. Uh, and it's just remarkable to me how, um, so almost a decade later, in 2009, um, somebody in Moscow decides, well, you know, this is, could be an interesting counterweight to the the world order. Mm. So they had a conference in uh, somewhere in Russia, uh, and they formalized BRICS as an institution, you know. Mm. And they basically had this vision, which is you know, uh, it vexes me what exactly their vision is. You know, to work together and be a counterweight to. Uh, I, th I think it's a. I, I actually think that it's a. It's a political organization, so uh, it doesn't have the strength or the might of the World Bank and the, IFC, the IMF and IFC. Uh, but it certainly has. It's it's a voice, mm -hmm. and if we're being honest, the last uh, BRICS summit that was held in South Africa had more more leeway and more airplay than G20, if you really think about it. When G20 countries sit around the table, uh, they usually produce a statement and it's a page long and that's it. Uh, if you see what BRICS did, and I think it's really, it's, it's political activism. And I think that, and I tend to agree with what Christian is saying, that a lot of these organizations are not just purely economic. They do have a political component. And if this is a medium in which these guys are, the global south and i use that advisedly <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, can push their voice yeah. uh, in the political arena then you know freedom yeah. so, of so, so i i really like to to push back on this and 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 and, and you know um evangelize you know a more realistic world view because I, okay. I i think that please go ahead especially from a zimbabwean and african perspective there's this narrative that is false that's quite popular mm -hmm. that says that one of the reasons why we're poor is because of the hegemony of the West, and we are somehow there's some you know uh, neo uh, imperialistic agenda 
that is being driven by institutions like the IMF and the World Bank and the G20. And we need to push back and we need this. So BRICS is kind of looked at like this knight, you know, uh, in shining armor that is going to rescue us from this <laughs> hegemony. And, and that's why it gets so much coverage because they talk about challenging the US dollar. They talk about an alternative uh, development banking institution. They talk about, right? And I, I, I actually think that um, we, it stops us from introspecting and mm. looking at our economic policies over the last 20, 30 years and having an honest conversation about what hasn't worked and what reforms and changes we actually need uh, to make to put us on a path to prosperity. And this distraction and gimmick that is BRICS to me necessary. is actually bad for us. Okay. I, I think I tend to agree with you uh, from an economic perspective. Not so sure I agree with you from a political perspective because I think that their voice is being heard. I don't think that they're going to take away the dollar. The dollar will be with us uh, certainly you know, during our lifetime. Uh, but I think that from a political voice and galvanizing a political voice, mm. they're doing a very good job. You know, we just don't agree with their methods, but you know, it's out there when you look at the, the media coverage. Uh, Christian, what, what do you think? Um, no, I mean, look, I think not, you, you actually, have, we, no, no. we can have our independent thoughts. Look, uh, I'm not going to get political here, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but in a way, you're in a good position because you can almost bystand and you, you look, you mentioned, you know, the West and their institutions, you mentioned the BRICS, you know, now the new thing. You can sort of watch this whole thing, right, as it evolves and you... I mean, I'm a strong believer in you are the master of your own fate. You know, you don't need institutions or other players to tell you what to do. I never liked that about, um, and I think at least on the teams I worked on, we always try not to come across as it's my way or the highway. You know, you negotiate, mm -hmm. you talk to people, say, okay, look, what works for you? But of course, within constraints, because you can't give money away unless there is, you know, something that is done. Mm -hmm. And... And you can choose for yourselves, you know. I mean, my take on these things is typically, you know, be mindful. The grass is not necessarily greener on the other side, right? Yeah. And as long as you keep that in mind, you know, it's your be choice. Open be open-minded. Be open-minded. Okay, so yeah. this is an interesting point in which we can just double-click on this. Mm. And I would like to talk about a time when all these different organizations actually get together to solve particular problems, which is uh, debt relief programs, and the Paris Club. So yeah. they usually come together under the Paris Club, and it's usually to solve uh, a particular country that's in a debt trap or debt distress or has uh, innumerable problems with uh, its uh, multilateral uh, lenders. Mm. And if we look at uh, 20 years ago or thereabouts, uh, and I'll look at Africa because, you know, we're in Africa, uh, and I've critically studied what happened in Ghana, Nigeria, and Zambia. I think those were the very successful debt relief programs and under the HIPIC mm -hmm. program. To just to explain the, the acronym to the audience. Okay, so these highly indebted poor, poor countries. Country, yeah. yeah, so that's uh, less than a thousand, I think, at the, at, at the time, yeah. thousand US dollars per, per capita. Uh, and then they were not the only countries that were under distress. If you look at Botswana, Kenya also, during that period, were also under distress, uh, debt distress. Hmm. But unfortunately, Kenya couldn't, uh, couldn't qualify yeah. under the HIPAA conditions. So they had to find their way out of their problems. And it seems like if you look at Ghana and Nigeria, yes, that resulted in Nigeria being the largest economy in Africa because suddenly 70% of their debt was forgiven and they were able to you know, get back into financial markets and get more capital, similarly with Ghana. But we've seen them always going back. It's like an alcoholic. <laughs> Sorry, Ufara, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's like you go, through, <laughs> <laughs> you go through this and they're always continuously relapsing. But it looks like Botswana is now safe. Looks yeah. like Kenya wobbles along the way, but, you know, they, they, they're okay. Um, what I want to... I don't want to get into the weeds. But what I want to understand is the the Paris Club debt negotiations. What's the thinking? Because what we're interested in on this show, it's not the actual details, mm. but we want to understand what's the thinking. Because we're <coughs> sitting on the other side. 
please tell us when we get into these negotiations, what's the thinking? Wow. Okay. No, um, it is indeed a complex construct. Maybe for your for the benefit of your viewers, the Paris Club was founded in 19, I think it was 1956, and Argentina was the first country that was treated and was actually the impetus for the Paris Club to be founded. Mind you, that is only for bilateral debt. Okay. So back in the days, there wasn't really a problem with multilateral. You know, it was small BOP support from the IMF, a few countries, um, and um, so yeah. There are a lot of conditions for Paris Club debt treatment. For example, okay. and let's let's just focus on Zimbabwe. I think that's what people are really interested in. Yes. And um, that was in a way when I started as the rest rep in, in 2014. That was sort of the mission, my mission chief, myself and the team were considering ourselves on how can we fix this, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously nine years down the road, um, Apparently not that easy. <laughs> and I get to that in a minute. Um, mm -hmm. Why? But on a technicality, you cannot have a Paris Club treatment of your bilateral debt without an IMF program. Okay? So that's a fact. Okay. Right? Which basically gives you a whole new set of constraints. Right? Mm -hmm. Because you can't have an IMF program because you have arrears to the World Bank and the African Development Bank and obviously the Paris Club, so they have to be on board. And never forget, that's actually one of my first discussions I had with a colleague um, in town from an IFI who thought, um, well, you know, we can design something without the bilaterals. And I just looked at him and said, yeah, in theory you can, but tell me, who sits on your board, my board, the World Bank's board? These bilaterals. So mm. do you think we can achieve anything by sort of not worrying about them, right? And the thing is, I believe, and I think that was sort of in a way a mistake that myself, I think, made at the time. We were very preoccupied with how can this be funded, right? I mean, how do you design it? Because you talked about HIPIC earlier. Zimbabwe is not on the list, never was, is not eligible based on the 2004 income criterion because, you know, obviously the institutions were smart enough not having this a revolving forever thing, right? So there's a sunset mm -hmm. clause. And um, so whatever treatment or thing Zimbabwe will eventually get or not has to be outside of the HIPIC. It could be mimicking something like HIPIC, mm -hmm. but it, at least for now, unless they change something or they have, I don't know, um, it can't be that. W what I'm getting from you is that this is very complex mm. and it, there's, there's no straightforward answer. You know... On a technical level, it may seem like that, but let me let me give you an example of what a dear, a good, f yeah, friend and colleague in a way said to me probably two years ago, mm -hmm. um, and that made me think about this whole issue with financing. You know, is the financing part of debt relief really that important? And you know, the government papers focused a lot on where can we get this from, where can we get that from, what should be our contribution, and so on. Yeah, yeah, that's it's not unimportant. Put it this way, right? Mm -hmm. But let's assume, let's let's take, for example, um, you know, do you want, I, I use a husband and wife example. So do you want Zimbabwe to be the husband or the wife? You decide. Okay. Yeah. You're talking to the wrong tree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the let's, wife. The, the wife. wife. Okay, fine. Yeah, the wife. Yeah. Zimbabwe the is wife. the wife. So let's say um, one day the wife decides, you know what? Husband, I had enough of you, right? Mm -hmm. I have a new boyfriend. I'm moving out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Three years later, down the road, um, the wife, you know, comes back and says, you know, I really made a big mistake. And um, I know, you know, shouldn't have done this. Can I move back in? So what do you think the husband will want to see? And, know? and you said the rules. African or European? <laughs> well, <laughs> say, say a mixture, <laughs> a global. <laughs> The, the point is that, you, that she can't just move in. Mm. Not with an African, probably not with a European or with an American, right? just like that. Yeah. What it means is that they probably have to sit down at a table and talk it over and see, you know, how is there, do we have common interests? Do we have um, a future? What do we want from each other? 
And the reason why I mention this is I think this is a nice way of thinking about Zimbabwe's relationship with the rest of the world. Yes, there was a time when Zimbabwe decided, you know, okay, we're not paying the debt anymore. I think they left the Commonwealth at some point in time. That's sort of yeah, like we the moving out part, from the right? Commonwealth in, in, in this in example. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what is important to make this work, remember, I believe, and I might be wrong, dear viewers, um, I believe this is not about money. Okay. You know, the EU, the Americans, and whoever creditor there is else, they have enough money to to solve this problem yeah. financially. It's a small, it's a small it's problem. Not, they could write it off in a heartbeat. Yeah. Look, some of this stuff is like 20, 30 years old. And um, I actually, and obviously I can't name that person, heard from someone, you know, that for us it's not about, this is in our minds, this is written off a long time ago. You know, they're not expecting this back. But in mm. order to formalize that, they want something, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And my point is, um, sitting down at a table with the major creditors or old friends, I'm thinking here the UK, for example, mm -hmm. I think would help, you know, getting closing in. You know, what do we want from each other? You know, do we have common values, common grounds? And then you can sort of move forward and okay. decide, okay, if everybody wants this, what do we want you to do? And okay. then you figure out how to do it. Okay, so I, what I'm getting is this is more a job for diplomats than yes. it is for economists. At the outset. Okay, all right. Yeah. So I, I, mm. I, I have a different view and I want you to perhaps um, poke holes in, in, in my view. Because I think in the, what you're saying is true in terms of the players involved here, that the counterparties are Paris Club uh, members, so for them, it's not just about the money because they are uh, political animals, hmm. right? But we have um, global capital markets and, you know, global debt markets are massive. You know, we were talking, um, you know, circa $100 trillion worth of global, you know, debt in these markets. So what we owe, you know, whether you call it $20 billion or $25 billion, and the arrears portion of that, it's a drop in the ocean yes. uh, in the context of the size of global debt markets. And um, if you look at our government today, it, from a revenue perspective, we're probably doing between three to three point five uh, billion dollars um, in um, tax collection per annum. And if we um, committed to uh, a payment of say half a half a billion dollars or billion dollars a year. We should be able, from private uh, debt capital players, be able to raise 10, 20, 30 billion dollars. Where would we be getting that? Uh, we actually can't pay 60 million a month at no, 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 the present no, 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 moment. No, no. What, I'm saying, what I'm saying is, if, if, if I believe, uh, and, and I'm wearing my hat as an investment banker here, if I got a mandate with a lot of latitude to say, listen, go and raise 20 uh, billion for Zimbabwe. Right, go find out what um, the the guys on the other side of the table would want from us, right? And I suspect that they would want to ring fence half a billion dollars, a billion dollars a year in Zimbabwe's cash flows, um, and they would merrily write us a check for twenty. Where would that 20. money be coming from? Right now, we just we don't have the leeway. And no, how, no, 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 how no, costly I, would it be? No, no. What I'm saying is, yeah, so, so, Africa so, so, so. Bank is charging twelve. 18%. I'm saying the, 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 the yeah the, the, there's a the market will, will will tell us what the price is. They'll tell us how to ring fence, you know, because we do export about six billion dollars a year, right? So if you that's not the if, country's exports. Those yes, are private companies. companies, but these are companies private that have companies. that have tax obligations, that pay royalties. That it's have, not enough. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, I can dream of a structure. I can imagine a structure where some of those export receipts are, are ring fenced. Right to um, be the installment. Are, are you aware that it's already happening and it's just not enough? Yeah, but already I, the Chinese I, I, Africa Zim Bank have done that. They've ring fenced it, but because of the cost, we yeah. actually cannot meet. Yeah, but, I, but, but, but I don't know whether you're hearing me. What I'm saying is, as a country, we could potentially commit. Half a billion dollars, a billion dollars. I'm saying it's impossible. Why, why, why is this impossible? This because is we don't have the leeway. 
The reason why we need these institutions, uh, and it goes back to the reason why these institutions were started in the first place, mm -hmm. is reconstruction of Europe, right? Similar the, to the Zimbabwe. Marshall Plan. Yeah. yeah, it's similar to Zimbabwe. That actually, it's these organizations saying that, you know, on your own, you just don't have but, but, the but, leeway. But, 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 but I'm clearly, you don't have the leeway. Explain it to me like I'm a six-year-old, because I'm clearly missing something. If, if somebody has... All our collections, yeah. all our tax collections right now, mm -hmm. at best, it's about four billion dollars a year. A year, all right. Agree. Okay, let's. And let's... we're spending seven to eight billion dollars already, as is. And you want to add on an extra interest payment? We actually cannot afford it. We just don't have the leeway. That's why these organizations will come in because they're saying that there's no private investor that will invest when your accounts are the way they are. Look at Ghana. It is defaulted on its euro bond. Mm -hmm. And you know the euro bond, Ghana euro bond is like something like 6 7%. It's not even onerous, but they defaulted on it. Yeah, Argentina because, has done it over and over again. Because <laughs> you don't have the leeway. Yeah, you don't have the leeway. But, so, but I don't think we've actually ever tried in a serious way. That's the point I'm trying to make. That we actually, as a country, have impressive hard currency cash flows per annum. And we've never actually had a serious conversation with the global debt marks to say, guys... What do we? What do you need from us? I mean, the politicians are gonna. It's gonna be a harder conversation because, like Christian rightly said, it's not just about the money. There are other issues. Um, but maybe, but, maybe but, come in. Let's see you know, what you think. Of course, you can do that. And I think the idea back in 2015, the whole Lima process, you know, you remember that loan mm -hmm. from Algeria that then didn't materialize, was meant to pay the $800, $800 million, sorry, mm -hmm. for the World, World Bank, Bank, right? And, and it wasn't, you know, and then some donors were complaining, oh, yeah, but this is not concessional. I mean, clearly market finance is definitely not concessional. Mm -hmm. yep. Doesn't meet the 35% criteria these institutions use. It was a bit interesting to hear that at the time because, you know, here is a donor or donor community that can't give anything for reasons they have to be happy with or live with. And then, you know, there might be a way out to fix this, not at market cost, but maybe not exactly at concessional terms, and and then people complain about it, right? It did fall through, but the point is, I think at this stage, you know, because you have accumulated since 2015, when we talked about, when I was very much involved in this, you know, I think it was 800 million for the World Bank. I think we are talking now about 1.3, 1.4, 1.4 yeah. billion. And that's just penalties and interest. Now, and this is just a question, this is me, right? This is not representing obviously anybody. How would you, from an ethical point of view, justify to your population that you borrow, say, at 15% on market terms to pay back a loan that started off with 300-something million, is now 1.3 because of rears and penalties and whatnot, um, that came from a development institution. I mean, I would find it hard to justify that if I was a politician, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we now have a bigger problem. Uh, since you are the representative uh, yeah, or since Lima, is we've added on another eight billion US dollar in loans. Uh, in other debt, yeah. In other debts. Uh, in Africa Bank, for example, we've added about one point five billion. The Chinese debts has come through. Then we we have the farmers. Mm. Uh, that's but about that's not a real debt. Uh, three point five billion. It's not like they wrote us a check for three point five billion. No, it's what we owe, and it's what must be paid. Mm. Whether we like it or not, it's now on the paper. It's been signed, and it's what we must pay. So I think it's onerous, and I think that unless we solve the debt problem, I think we'll always have a problem in Zim. And the new lenders are just not going to lend this money anymore. I mean, if you look at the Africa Zim Bank, uh, you know, you, you talk about concessionary and market rate, but I think this is actually extortionist because it's it's coming in at twelve. In fact, when you put all the charges in, it's about fourteen percent, and they've ring fenced all our exports, uh, and we just don't have enough room. To actually be more developmental. Look, I don't think it's uh, honest. I think I think it's just fair given how we've behaved. So if 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 you are a financial delinquent and you've uh, basically defaulted on um, all your more generous uh, good faith loans, yeah, the only way you're going to raise any amount of money is with a structure that is ring fenced. That is honor that you are labeling honors. I just mm -hmm. I think it's just fair. Well, I think you get into a vicious uh, cycle, and this is what uh, Argentina but, gets into, right? 
Yeah. I, like continuously, you're yeah. getting into debt because you can't pay it. You're in a debt trap. But you know, typically that's you know a result of say policy missteps. You know, in a country because I mean, why would you go back and back over and over <laughs> again? You know. Um, no, look. I mean, it is it is a challenging issue and. What I sometimes, or what I found interesting at the time is, obviously I heard from private sector players and other sides that, oh, you know, don't give them any money, you know? And okay, that's a fair view, you know, they can have that view. Um, but what they typically miss is there's a huge benefit if Zimbabwe were to be able to solve this arrears issue and the debt. Right now, mm -hmm. even the best companies in the country cannot borrow under I don't know what the latest it's probably i mean i think delta somewhere was six or seven percent or so it's probably more yeah. now because interest rates globally are rising um and you know if you're a small player i mean either you can't borrow at all internationally or it would be astronomically expensive absolutely if the country risk goes away i mean obviously you probably would have to behave for a while for people to believe <laughs> it um then that's a huge benefit to private sector players you mm. know Okay, so Access another finance interest uh, rate. another interesting question, uh, and this is just to you know help us again because you've actually been on the other side of the table uh, when you when you were still in Washington and you would come across African countries again because we are in Africa. Uh, could you give us your perspective how it has evolved over time when you're sitting on the other side? Did you get the feeling that these African countries? knew what they were talking about and how honest were they and where would you put Zimbabwe and rank Zimbabwe when you consider Zimbabwe when, when our authorities are in Washington do okay. they behave themselves <laughs> yes they do of course <laughs> I hope when you mention other side I hope you don't mind might mean the dark side <laughs> um, no look I mean Economics is an interesting, or, you know, in politics, interesting, or then let's stick with economics, interesting subject. Because what people sometimes miss is, especially, I mean, when I studied it many, many, many years ago, actually, I can say decades ago, um, it was more, it was less formal, less formulas, less mathematics, right? Yes. It's more equations now, and we try to explain everything through equations and tend to forget in the process that at the end of the day, economics is a social science. It depends what people it depends on people right mm. the outcome depends on people how they behave you know this is the whole story about game theory you know where you tell them what if this guy does this if the central bank does this what should the minister and so on right mm -hmm. but um just that aside coming back to your question um of course they do i mean you look they're they're as diplomatic as any other country what they think in private i don't know right mm -hmm. but um I think, you know, and I think it's important as a country, if you come to Washington, that, you know, it's not like, you know, the high side and, the, you know, they should be equal, you know. And I've mm. always felt like, you know, the people in Washington were listening. I mean, in the meetings I was part of, mm. listening to the authorities, the authorities were listening to the constraints that obviously the institution had. Um, so maybe you can specify more. Okay, so that's, exactly a, that's, your, a, that's yeah. a diplomatic answer, but I'm going <laughs> to, you know, push back on this and uh, double down. Uh, of the African countries, which country would you say was very good at articulating their issues and getting as much help as they could? Okay, normally I would say, I don't know, but it's actually one, and I'm only mentioning it because it really sticks out. That was um, Liberia when um, their president, the lady, I forgot her name now. Uh, um, Salif. Yeah, exactly. Um, lobbied, and she did a fabulous job lobbying for, you know, the hippie and all that. Okay. Um, but, you know, this is not, I think in a way, that's not your question, right? Because mm. this was a very specific task in a way. And if you just think about, you know, the annual meetings, spring meetings that the institutions have in Washington or every four years somewhere else, I would say, I mean, and I obviously don't know what the 180 something countries, you know, how they, their meetings go. Mm. But that to me sticks out. And I think it was always sort of. Well, well, what, were the key, what, what were the key ingredients? Well, look, it is about. And I think this is something where I think Zimbabwe probably can do better you know and we touched upon it before we started the whole pr thing 
Okay. Right? Um, I'm always disappointed when I see a negative headline on Zimbabwe, um, say, in a London newspaper or in, a Washington, in, in the Washington Post or whatnot. Not that it's not true, or it probably it's overblown, but you don't see the many, many positive things because they never make it, you know, mm. in these venues, you know. And, you know, obviously my former colleagues would say, ah, oh, gosh, you know, Christian, yeah, he went native, you know. That was always <laughs> the thing. That was always the thing that I heard towards the end. Um, to me, it's not that. It's like, you know, just, I think, have a sense of what's fair and what's not. Mm. Um, and, but yeah, I think that was one of the things I noticed from the beginning that would help okay you know hire somebody who i mean not me i'm an economist you know hire mm. somebody who is very good with public relations with media and whatnot and highlight the good stuff you do you know okay. so, so i've got a question there because there's something interesting happening uh on the global stage uh with regard to media and you know so there's now this uh dichotomy as it were between uh, the legacy or the traditional media you mentioned the washington post and you know um the newspapers in london whether it's the financial times or uh the times of, uh, and lately um the reputation of that legacy traditional media media has taken a beating um you know whether it's because of um their coverage of covid and other issues i think in the public you know they're not as trusted as they used to be. And you've got what they call earned media, which is, you know, uh, social media for the most part, Facebook, X, um, YouTube. A lot of people actually get their news from the people that they follow and trust on social media. And they don't trust the New York Times and the Washington Posts and the CNNs. That's actually world. scary, I, I think. I mean, um, I'm old school, <laughs> but that scares me. Because yeah, so you're, social so, so media... You know. Yeah, you, you're old school. <laughs> yeah, sure. And so do you think that um, because these institutions like the IMF and World Bank have been around for a long time and they are typically very conservative in the way they do business and, and how they consume information, do you think they are alive to this change that we're seeing in the media universe? And mm -hmm. also like from a national level, maybe we as a country aren't doing enough in terms of putting out this PR in the new media that's dominating the, the, the world stage, which is uh, these platforms. Look, I mean, the IMF, for example, I don't, I mean, obviously I can't talk about the World Bank, has a whole department that deals with public relations and media, you know, external relations department. I think they changed the name, communications. Um, yes, I mean, you can't, you can't get stuck in the past. You have to adapt. And yes, whether you like it or not, social media is a part of our life today. I mean, I'm just trying to prevent it for my kids from getting into it too soon. But <laughs> the emphasis here is too soon. I will not be it, able to prevent it. From, they will be on social yes, media. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, I th in, in, and so is the IMF. But they do it, obviously, in a very, very cautious way, you know. Um, when you say that people believe their friends, you know, who get information from who knows, and not anymore the New York Times, I, yes, I do find that scary. I'm not saying that the New York Times is the only place for good information, no. But I would argue the other way around that I'm not convinced that what I see on social media is actually good information. Mm, you know? Or at least you need to fact check it, you know. Yeah, but you see, if I'm following you, for example, assuming see, that... that's why I'm not on it. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but or somebody like Tinashe or uh, someone like Elon Musk or um, the president of a country... I, I, I like the, the way you have just put my name next to Elon Musk. Yeah, but, well but, but, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, so if, if I'm actually following people that um, I know or I know of as authorities in particular domains, and I'm actually getting their opinion straight from them without the filter of a journalist uh, and a headline and uh, an opinion. So I'm, I, I hear Tinashe, you know, uh, firsthand what he actually thinks. I hear what Ellen actually thinks. I hear what uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, when he's posting, you know, what he's thinking. Well, without maybe, the filter of well, maybe not uh, as a government, maybe not mm. uh, as private individuals, maybe. Mm. But I think the import of what I'm getting 
is that you need a concerted effort, campaign effort. So if you're Zimbabwe and you're in a debt arrears clearance and debt reform, right? You need to sell a story using whatever medium, social media, the old media, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But you need a concerted effort to say this is what we're selling. And every bit of government, everyone in government, it needs to be a concerted effort. Mm. Everybody understands what the messaging is. Yeah. Right? And also, it can't just be propaganda. Mm -hmm. You also need to do the hard work, you know, and then project the hard work that you're doing. Yeah. Hmm. No, I mean, you have, coming back to what Rafael said, you know, if he listens say, to you, you know, you're the friend. I mean, then that person who puts out that information is having a huge responsibility. Because, yes, obviously, like in the IMF, there's a whole department. Before something goes out, mm. there are quite a few people who have looked at that, right? And so is it in print media. Like, you know, before something comes into the New York Times printed, there are quite a few people who vetted that right? yeah, true. and what i find well if you know we're venturing off here um a little bit scary is if people Friday just June. shoot out okay. you know from stuff the hip. From, yeah. yeah from the hip maybe <laughs> and there are and you know this is what i mean by responsibility you know not everybody you know thinks maybe the way you think or you think saying hmm, is that true where can i get some more information on this you know many people just jump on it yeah you know true. and that's when you Get, you know, I think in the US they termed it now fake news or whatnot. Yeah, oh, that's sure. a Donald Trump term. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it's a good time for us to go into the lighter matters. <laughs> uh, tell us a bit about the, the good, the ugly, and or the bad, the good, the bad, and the ugly, about actually working for the IMF. Uh, um, okay, let me start with the good. Yeah. I don't know, I don't think I can find ugly, but let's let me see. Um, From my own perspective, what mm. I like the most, and I will don't want to miss a single year of my 21 years with the institution, what I liked from day one is that you can work with people from pretty much all over the world, okay. right? My, in my first ever department, I walked in, my division chief was from Brazil. My deputy division chief was from, I think, Ghana. Um, our director was from Malawi. I was in the African department. Mm. Um, and I had a colleague, you know, a fellow economist from Bulgaria, and that was 26 years ago. So I think that was yeah. kind of it. And um, and through my career, I mean, I always worked with people from different countries, different walks of lives, male, female. Um, that to me, that experience of learning, because you know, for example, once I had a team with one guy, actually, it was my Kyrgyz assignment. My desk economist was from Georgia. And by the way, here's, the, you know, how the IMF works and how former Soviet states work. You have very young people in very high positions. So he was actually the deputy governor of the Central Bank of Georgia oh, wow. before he joined the IMF. Okay. And he joined the IMF as an economist, right? So, um, but he was young. No, he was very young. I mean, he could have, he mm. could not, I mean, according to the rule, he could not have hired him much higher than that, right? Okay. Um, But that was a very interesting experience because, um, you know, in their culture, a boss means more than maybe in my culture, right? I mm. mean, I always sort of thought, you know, if I don't agree, I can obviously respectfully say something. yeah. And it took me quite a while to get these guys to actually disagree with me. I said, <laughs> look, the, the whole idea of having a team, and this is maybe the second beautiful thing about it, Mm -hmm. is I believe that, and I think that's the IMF's belief, that, you know, a collective of different people from different backgrounds can make a better decision. Of course, the boss in the end, I was as mission chief, it was my decision in the end. Mm -hmm. But I think I could make better decisions because I had all the input from these different backgrounds, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you might think differently and you might tackle the problem differently. So that's a very good thing. No, but, you know, after six months or you know, three to six months, they kind of, you know, said, uh, Christian, I think you got this one wrong. Like, Thank you. <laughs> finally, you, up. Yeah. you know, so I don't have to double check everything myself. <laughs> um, you know, and um, bad, well, sometimes work hours. <laughs> But, you know, it's, I mean, one should, it's not a complaint. I mean, it's yeah. just, you know, sometimes it, it was part of the job. harder as part of the job. Yeah. 
Um, and not actually not really, to be honest mm. with you. No. So it's a it's a career that you would encourage a, a number of our economists Look, in school that you know what this is a. It is one of the, in my view, most interesting places you can be as a macroeconomist. Of mm. course, if you're after the big money, then and you know, and you don't mind the up or out mentality of the Goldman Sachs of the world, mm -hmm. then yeah, sure, you make more there. But you have to, I mean, look, there were different, different types of economists in a way, you know, that you have the ones that are very interested in doing more, you know, more research, more sort of, you know, hardcore economics, new models, equations, stuff. These are the ones that want to work You know, in big economies say like, you know, I was never interested to work on any of the Western European countries. Mm -hmm. You know, I started off in Africa. Actually, at the time that I wanted to because I came from Europe. Right. And then I realized mm -hmm. after having worked on my first assignment was the Gambia. I have to admit, mm -hmm. you know, we talked geography a little bit earlier. I had to look on the map. Where is that place? <laughs> yeah. I knew Africa, of course. <laughs> but where exactly is it in Africa? Yeah. So and this is a tiny little place within Senegal in a way, right? Yeah. Again, um, a leftover from colonial days. You know, Gambia had the port, you know, at the mm -hmm. river Gambia and obviously the French had <laughs> the other one, the other surrounding. So, and you know, I realized over time that you can actually get more done and achieve more in a country that is maybe slightly less or less developed, far less mm. developed than Europe. And I enjoyed it. it was, yeah. You know, it depends on what your preferences are. Oh, fantastic. I liked helping people more than getting another research paper out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so where are you, where would we place you um, philosophically? Because Tinashe is an anarchist. We're both libertarian, but he's on the anarchist wing of yeah. the libertarian uh, spectrum. I'm on more of the small government side. And we basically are ardent uh, free market capitalists that believe that governments should be very small and should stay out of the way. They should just basically be referees and let the entrepreneurs and the markets figure things out. So, so, so as an economist, how do you see things? Where, where, where do you sit philosophically? Okay, um, maybe let me describe it like a, think of it as a cocktail. Like, I'm an economist capitalist with a twist of socialism. <laughs> right? No. It doesn't sound let, like a let, cocktail. Let me explain. <laughs> you can go back. Um, no, look, I mean, I, I do believe in markets, of course, you know, and mm. this is one of the things that people need to realize here that, you know, this exchange rate thing will never work unless you let the market drive it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Amen to that. <laughs> but I also believe that, you know, there should be some some controls in place, sort of like, you know, to me, look, if you are government, right, and somebody asks government, look, I put you guys in charge of, say, Manchester United, okay, um, who do you want to be, the coach, the sports director, or the groundskeeper, and what should you be? Right. My view is they should be the groundskeeper, create the playing field that's level so the players can play properly. Right. Not like mm -hmm. with holes and whatnot. And and I think that is one thing that um, in my sort of world I would like to see and and have checks and balances in place that it's not like a system like survival of the fittest because you don't want that either. I mean, I think society has a responsibility. You know, it's a bit like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know whether we get to that still, um, you know, that you take care of your elderly people that, you know, from one day to another, they have nothing, you know, that's not really a good thing. Um, and this is sort of something, you know, that I realized, well, I realized the hard way in the US, you know, the whole healthcare issue, you know, yes, I do believe in tax provided healthcare, <laughs> tax finance provided healthcare or generalized how do you call it, general healthcare? Like, you know, why does it work? Universal healthcare. You know, less there are problems with it mm -hmm. and you have to design it in a proper way. But, uh, you know, and examples maybe being the NHS in the UK where you have long waiting lists and, you know, this sort of gap between now private and so on. Mm -hmm. But at least have something, you know. I'm not saying, and this is sort of like the twist that I was okay. talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a cocktail. Uh, I think 
that's another discussion for another day. Yeah. Uh, maybe to just finish off, uh, and this is specifically to Zimbabwe, as somebody who has experience with the IMF, has experience with debt relief, maybe you can speak directly to our policymakers. <laughs> what advice would you give them right now at this point in Zimbabwe? What would you say to them directly? What do they need to do? Well, I mean, as I alluded to earlier, I think what is important, yes, it is important to figure out how this can all be done technically. Um, but I wouldn't put like the top priority on that. I think what is important, and I think this is already happening to some degree, the African Development Bank has been working on that quite eagerly. The most important thing is get people on, around the table and get to talk, you know, whether, you know, who, who wants what. I think it's also important to ask them directly, what is it you want? I had this problem once and, um, mm -hmm. you know, because when we had the discussion with the development partners said, okay, fine. You know, there was the S&P, they've done this, they've done that. Oh yeah, but there's this and said, okay, listen, and I'm obviously not saying who it was, mm -hmm. but I asked, what is it you want? And to this day, I did not get an answer. <laughs> right. So, Look, it is it is politics involved, obviously. To me, the best way is be diplomatic, um, use the diplomatic route, do talk, and hopefully one day we can solve this problem. I hope in my lifetime here. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> well, on that diplomatic note, uh, thank you very much, Christian. Yeah. Uh, Ron, always a pleasure. Yeah, uh, yeah. This was very interesting. Uh, I think there's a lot more for us to, to talk, so we hope to have you again on the show, and we can just talk about... Uh, you know, economics and the philosophies. And, oh, yeah. You know, the cocktail. The cocktail and why we don't believe and, and, and in cocktails. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps exercise them of his belief. <laughs> or it's very to. small <laughs> in socialism. Yeah. <laughs> we shall bring in the water. <laughs> no, water. You, know Only what I, you know what I mean. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, have yourself a wonderful weekend. Please continue commenting. Please let us know. Well, your thoughts on these and many other issues. Otherwise, uh, have yourself a wonderful week ahead. Cheers. <laughs>